We live on the cutting edge of physics, material science, engineering, and nanotechnology. Because at Lockheed Martin, we're engineering a better tomorrow. All right, good morning. Well, it's exciting for me to be up here today to kick off your exciting day of discovery. But first, does anyone know what this number represents? Let me give you a hint. This was my dream when I was your age. Fly Mach 1 supersonic and be a test pilot. Did you see that vapor cone coming off the aircraft? That vapor cone is formed when temperature and pressure drop rapidly across the sound wave. It causes rapid condensation behind the aircraft. Telltale sign, you're about to break the sound barrier. Mach, speed of the object, in this case the aircraft, divided by the speed of sound. So Mach 2, twice the speed of sound. This was my dream. What's your dream? What if you had no limits placed on you? No earthly limits like gravity, friction. No resource limits. I had all the money and a great laboratory to work with. No physical limits. You could do everything, anything you wanted to do. No limits placed on you by other people. What would you do? Who would you be? Hold that thought. This first. Congratulations are in order. By the mere fact that you're sitting in this auditorium right now, you join a select group of people who, frankly, don't care about the limits. People like the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers, a couple of bicycle mechanics, right? First to fly. Chuck Yeager broke the speed of sound. Cowboy, Albert Einstein. When, you're, when you push the limits in science and technology, there's no going back. But think about it. When you develop a new vaccine or a new material, a new fiber, you open doors not just for yourself, but for everybody else. There's no undiscovering that. What other kind of field allow you to do something like this? Permanent change, exciting, bringing new ideas to life. So strap in. I'm going to talk to you today about living your life outside the limits, about dreaming big dreams, and pursuing your goals no matter what the obstacles are. Big dreams. These people had big dreams. I had big dreams. First thing I want to impress upon you, big things don't happen without big dreams. Don't let anyone else suppress your dreams. Okay. Only you know the goals you're willing to fight for and the path you're willing to take and sacrifices you're willing to make. Okay. Not teachers, not your friends, not your family. Speaking of friends, I was not exactly Miss Popularity in high school. Actually, I was kind of a self-conscious loner. I'm sure none of you get that. There I am on the, in the left photo on the left-hand side. Now, I did like uh, dealing in small teams and going to the laboratory, especially in uh, middle school, where uh, we got to play and make a big mess in the laboratory, got to play with reptiles, right? And generally, making any excuse possible to get out of classes I didn't like, like English. I'm sure you can't relate to that either. But what that young lady had going for her was uh, she dreamt big. She wanted to do big things, and she was willing to fight for them. I wanted to be a test pilot and an astronaut. At that time, there weren't many female pilots, and there were zero female astronauts. But that didn't matter, because that was somebody else's limit. It wasn't mine. Fortunately, uh, my family was very supportive. My parents allowed me to get my pilot's license before I even got my driver's license. My high school was a public high school. My high school was ranked last in the district. My district was ranked last in the state. This is a potential limit. But I had fantastic teachers who pushed me to utilize every opportunity that came my way. They pushed me into becoming a, on the math club and the debate team and take leadership positions 
and develop my potential. I joined the Civil Air Patrol, which was my, my first blush with the military, if you will. The Civil Air Patrol, it's kind of like scouts on wings. Because in the Civil Air Patrol, as a student, you learn how to fly, you learn about space, you learn about navigation. And we had a real world mission. We did search and rescue for downed pilots in the United States. Doesn't get any cooler than that. And there's no obligation to join the military. So dreams. As I said, I was a pilot in, in high school, and I wanted to fly jets, and jets were too expensive to rent. So I looked into the military, and it turns out to be a military pilot, you need to have a four-year degree, and I wanted a degree in aeronautical engineering. It turns out the Air Force Academy has a top 10 program for engineering, and I looked into the Air Force Academy, and the biggest factor, yeah, it was free. Free was good, so I apply. Opportunity knocked, and the door hit me in the head as it opened up. I failed the physical fitness exam. Yeah, that was a limit I didn't see coming. I didn't realize you had to do pull-ups. <laughs> I procrastinated in taking the physical fitness exam, so I missed out that year. But I was determined. I wanted to be a jet pilot. So I worked a year. I reapplied to go to the Air Force Academy. Sorry. Right. So I reapplied to go to the Air Force Academy. And, but the one thing I wanted to, to roll into you right now is that I, that was a bad year for me. I had to work hard, really consider if I really wanted to go there. So when I think about um, the second thing I want to impress upon you is that failure. You know, it's not about failing. It is about not giving up. When you're determined to go after your dreams and not give up. You know, Walt Disney, Steve Jobs, the Wright brothers, Einstein, they failed multiple times. Do you remember anything they failed at? No. You could actually say they failed their way to success. The one thing they had in common, they had vision and passion. Where people saw limits, they saw opportunities. They weren't going to give up. So neither was I, and neither should you. So to quote the famous and ancient philosopher, Yoda, <laughs> do or do not, there is no try. I chose do. Pressed on, tried again, went to the Air Force Academy, had a great time. Uh, those four years learning about aeronautical engineering, I got to design, build, and compete balsa wood aircraft. I got to play in the wind tunnel with lifting bodies and nozzles. It was a great time. I graduated from the academy, and I went to military pilot school. And as cool as that was, and as cool as I look in that photograph over there, I still wanted to be a test pilot. Why? Because I wanted to be the one to define the limits. I wanted to be the one that brought new capabilities for people to use. I wanted to be the one to make aircraft safer for people to fly. So I went to the, to the test pilot school. And when I, as I was going through my design uh, portion of my training at the academy, I recognized that every airplane is designed for a certain function. But every airplane can be described in general, its limits, into something called a flight envelope. So every aircraft has a flight envelope. This is a sample flight envelope. Inside the green area, the test pilots try to maximize performance of the airplane inside that area. And we actually like to expand it if we can, provide capabilities, do things to the airplane so that we open up that green area. Now the x-axis is velocity, it's airspeed. So the leftmost portion of the green is the slowest the airplane can go and still stay in flight. And the part on the right to the green is the fastest it goes in normal flight. Now if you proceed out further into the yellow area on the right, it's cautionary. You can go out there for short periods of time, but bad things can happen, so you don't want excursion out there for too long. If you go out to the structural damage area, that, obviously red, right? Red is bad. Bad things can happen. 
panels can start coming off the airplane. Or you get something called flutter, which is a coupling mode between the dynamics of the aircraft and the actual structure of the aircraft. Here's a picture of a UAV undergoing flutter. We're doing some UAV testing. And that's that oscillation. Now, that is bad news right there. And if you were sitting in there, you'd be pretty sick. And it can cause permanent deformation of the structure. And then you take it, and you find the limit. OK, so that's the limit. We don't want to go there. <laughs> the vertical axis is load factor, g's. 1 is the baseline. Lift equals weight, straight and level flight. Everything is good. You feel normal. You yank back on the stick. You're loading up the airplane. Okay, you're feeling it because it's pushing against you. You feel very heavy. And once you go to the limit, you go beyond that, you can start bending things or systems stop working. Conversely, on the other side, if you push forward, you start to go weightless like you're in space. And then you start to go a negative G where your knees come up and hit your ears. That's the negative G limit. Here's an F-22 doing a positive G pull-up and a pushover. There she is gaining some airspeed. This is a fantastic demo. Snatch the stick. Nice and tough. Push over. And there she goes, zero G. Now, perhaps some of you have felt G-forces before. How many of you have been on a roller coaster before? Yeah, it's a lot of you. You've probably felt Gs on a roller coaster. Now, Here's a couple of guys really excited about getting on a wicked roller coaster. They are super excited, aren't they? And here they go. That we call, ladies and gentlemen, is G loss of consciousness. All the blood <laughs> is flowing from their head to their torso and into their bodies. They are out. You can see the positive Gs on their faces and a little light Gs going on. A rest assured, as soon as they get back to 1G, the blood will flow back into their brains. They'll wake up again. They actually stayed unconscious the entire ride. <laughs> Don't be like those guys. OK, in test pilot school, we also uh, flew fighter aircraft like this F-16. We flew bombers. We flew helicopters like this UH-60. We flew World War II airplanes, aerobatic airplanes, and some weird stuff like, like the Goodyear blimp. Now, I say this is you know, all fun, we had a great time, but you know, test pilot school was a lot of work. Uh, and, so, and getting your degree is a lot of work. Sometimes you question yourself, like, you know, do I really want to do this? Do I want to keep going on? And maybe this isn't for me. And at that point, you, you got to dig in deep and remember why you set those goals in the first place and what the rewards are like when you press your personal limits. After test pilot school, I went to the C-17 program uh, where I helped uh, create the envelope for this C-17. That's a hand-built airplane. It's the first one. It's 585,000 pounds. And I uh, did a lot of airdrop testing. This could be ammunition, supplies, people jumping out of the airplane. Um, and we wanted to make it safe for them exiting the airplane and for getting the seatings on the ground. And we did some weird tests, like dropping rockets out of the aircraft. That was a lot of fun. It's a lot of weight sliding in the back of the aircraft. And can be a little squirrely flying the aircraft at that point. But that was just cool. If you can't fly on a rocket, might as well kick one out of the back of your airplane. <laughs> All right, I also did a lot of air refueling. That's when we place two, two large airplanes in close proximity to each other, which is normally inherently dangerous. Uh, and we go up, and from that hose, uh, we actually pass gas. So they provide uh, gas pumping at us uh, into, into the aircraft so we can extend our range. But essentially, you have to be really careful because there's dynamics between these two large aircraft and can cause some real problems. So we actually had to expand the envelope so everybody could uh, do air feeling in this aircraft. And there she goes. Finally, I did a lot of performance testing in the airplane. Uh, this is a landing performance test for dirt runways. I did dirt and mud runways. What we wanted to make sure is that this airplane could land on a 3,000-foot dirt strip. Just like when you ride your bike really fast and you hit the brakes on, on asphalt, you stop pretty quick. You hit your brakes on gravel or dirt, you start to squirt a little bit. Maybe it takes a little longer for you to stop. This is what we're testing here. We call this 14 wheeling. Of course, after this test, it gets mighty dusty inside the cockpit. All right, so that was a lot of fun being part of that program. I wanted to learn more about flight dynamics uh, and mechanics, and so I, I entered uh, California State University Fresno for my master's degree in mechanical engineering. Uh, it's a tough degree, but I tell you, my instructors were all in the flight test programs or part of NASA Dryden, the engineers there. And, 
not only did they, were they great instructors, but they provided great opportunities for me to learn how to apply mechanical engineering knowledge to what it was I was doing. At this point in my career, I applied uh, to become an astronaut. Uh, and although I wasn't selected, I was, uh, I was a little disappointed. It was time for me to take stock in what I was doing. But I tell you what, I look back at my path and how I pressed myself at many opportunities. And I just had a phenomenal time. I had an opportunity to do a lot of great stuff. As an inflection point, I learned I want to do more. So I described a, a path to my future that included a similar lack of limits. I uh, commanded an air refueling unit in combat. I commanded a wing where we taught military pilots how to teach people to become uh, pilots. Uh, my time with Air Force One, I not only do it, I had an opportunity to escort the president and manage Air Force One operations, but I flew the vice president and secretary of state around the world. So that was my dream, uh, which was all after, as because of the fact that I was pursuing a life of STEM. So I'll go back and say, what, what's your dream? Even though that may look faint right now, what are the possibilities? What I do know is that the opportunities that you have right now, way better. Don't compare to what I had. Why is that? Take a look. technology that you will take advantage of. When I was sitting in your seats, I couldn't even imagine the reality that would occur 35 years later. Think about it. How many of you saw the movie Back to the Future? All right, more than I thought. All right, awesome. <laughs> Hoverboards. In the early 80s, I was at the skateboard parks. I don't even know if they have those anymore. This is where they made cement really smooth so you could do jumps and skateboards. That thing came out, I thought, I want one of those. Last year, hoverboards, all the rage. I mean, if you could accept the whole battery fire thing. Other than that, they were great, <laughs> right? You get the idea. I, it morphed into a tool that you all are using. Video games. I like my video game was Pong, right? And when I graduated from high school, it was Pac-Man. The electronic noises it used to make and 2D totally. Look at you guys, modern warfare, 4D, you know, engaging with each other. Real sounds, sounds of people, right? I could not have imagined that. I mean, I like my, you know, I mean. And how many, who, who knows what this is? Come on. The old, peop, old people like me, put your hand down. OK. That's a card catalog. This is where we found out where the book was in the library that you wanted to read. It's the Dewey Decimal System. Perhaps the teachers can tell you about that later. OK? For you, the world is literally at your fingertips. So what does this all mean for you? Look, are you the one that's going to design an airplane that goes from New York to London in an hour? Are you the one that's really going to get to sustainable energy, which will change our environment, 
and change our economy? Are you the one that's going to develop a, a cure for cancer? Are you the one that's going to take all that big data and harness it so you can get at some of the huge problems we have in this world? Where do we start? Your opportunities. Right now, joining math and science clubs, competing in robotics, lasers, drones, Exstellar, space competitions, cyber competitions, cyber patriot, it's all there for you. Get out there. Join the clubs. Have the courage to compete and develop your talents right now when these opportunities come by. I'm going to end where I started. What's your dream? As you create that path to where you want to go, no, you're going to take it one step at a time. There's times you're going to walk it. There's times you're going to run it. There's times you're going to climb it. But stay focused on the path. Okay, don't stray. Work towards your goals. Yogi Berra, who is a famous baseball player and manager, once said that baseball is 90% mental and the other half is physical. <laughs> that guy, not a math scholar. <laughs> but what he meant was your mental attitude determines your success. In the Air Force, we say your attitude determines your altitude. So don't be afraid of heights. Look, the Air Force is but one path to achieve a dream in STEM, exceed your limits, and be part of something greater than yourselves. But no matter where you want to pursue your STEM talents, in a big industry, in a laboratory, in a university, or in your basement, we have a couple things in common. We bring crazy ideas to reality. We're dreamers, bound only by the artificial limits we place upon ourselves. We may not be able to describe the future sitting here today, but we, what we know is what was, lies within us that's going to get us there. So I ask you, you ready to live your life without limits? You only live once. Thanks for your time.